Let's dive into some altered tunings and talk about why old gear is just so damn awesome. Metal Bass Monday. So before we get started, I'd like to invite you to like, subscribe, and please share if you enjoy these videos. And it really does help out the channel and keep things going. The, the more people I can reach with it and the more the channel gets promoted, the more the other series I'm doing and the information that I'm trying to put out with the other educational stuff is going to get to more people. And that's ultimately the ideal. So it's always appreciated if you can share it on any forums you're on, things like that. And make sure if you subscribe, hit that bell. So with that being said, uh, the ultimate production and mixing course, where I'm going to take the formation of a project to composition, writing, pre-production, recording, engineering, mixing, mastering, all the way out to the actual release of a project, has begun. Uh, the intro to it is up for my patrons on Patreon and Subscribestar. Links down below if you want to get in on that. And episode one of that is probably the most important talk I could give anyone about how to make sure that your project succeeds, even if you're just writing music for yourself or if you're taking on practicing and trying to develop yourself as an artist. So good conversation there. And for my patrons, if you haven't checked into the account yet, make sure you do. It's, uh, it's something that's going to set the stage for the entire rest of the series, both on the patron channels and here on YouTube. So... And with that in mind, thank you to all my patrons, as always. It's always much appreciated. Your feedback has been invaluable, and it really helps me kind of navigate the narrative for the different education series and things like that, and the secondary push that's going to happen for the new year. A lot more content, including that new series, and a couple of surprises. I'm hoping you enjoy. If you didn't catch it a couple episodes back, I also mentioned that I'm going to be doing demo and gear review for Guitar Interactive magazine. So you'll be able to see some more gear demos from me over there, along with ones that are going to be coming up on the channel. And we're also in talks for me to start doing some lessons and articles over there. So more content in more places. Metal-based domination. It's coming. So again, thanks to all my patrons, and I hope to see you over at Guitar Interactive and on those channels with the additional content. So let's talk altered tunings. I know for a lot of people straying out of the standard tunings or the one that we use the most, which is drop tuning, is a little weird. They don't know how to experiment or, you know, can be kind of intimidating, thinking you're going to mess up your instrument. Trust me, it'll be fine. But... I want to come at it from a little bit of a different angle after I talk about the ones I've used the most and confront a couple of things, too, that I think have become I don't know, kind of issues in metal as far as the way people think of it anyway. So let's get started with the altered tunings I tend to use the most and I think have the most use, and then we'll get into the others. As you, If you don't already tune or try things differently... The most common is obviously going to be drop tuning. You hear it all the time, drop B, drop C, you know, in metal it's incredibly popular. And all it means is you're taking your bottom string and you're dropping it one whole step down, keeping the others the same. So the note value becomes that this string and then this string being like on this one, the B and the A become the same value. So if here's your A string, this one, this B, you would drop a whole step to become A as well. So now it's an octave. That's standard drop tuning. One that I feel like has some more use that people aren't using quite as much in this way is doing what's called double drop tuning, which would be dropping this string and this string a whole step and keeping the rest the same. But there's a difference that I usually try and do with this to give me a little bit extra that opens up an avenue for bass playing that a lot of people aren't using right now. That would be that this string being the E, and this is mostly for five, the E string I would match to the key of whatever the guitar player is in. Like say if he's in C, I'm going to make this C. Then I'm also going to drop this string 
to be a fourth below that. So in this case, even though I don't use notes that low, really, usually the lowest I go is A, in extreme cases, A flat. Uh, but this would become G. So the way I use it the most is I have a lot of songs that are in D flat, so I would tune this string to D flat, and then this below a drop below that one as well. So I have the same, all my pitch is correct in between those two strings, but what it opens up for me is that I now have a string where I can play counterpoint lines to what the guitar is doing. So if this is his lowest point, this C sharp, I have my C sharp here, but now I've got a flat seven, major six, flat six, and a fifth below. So now I can open up and do some other things underneath of him, which is almost unheard of in metal anymore because everybody's always trying to play the absolute lowest note. The guitar tunes as low as he can, the bass tunes down to match it. If you save yourself that room, the double drop can have a really big advantage. So if you can get the guitar player to stay in a somewhat reasonable range, C to D flat or C sharp, whichever you might want to call it, and then you have your string dropped underneath of that to match it. So again, if this is C sharp, then you're going to be in G sharp on here. You can actually play lines under the guitar and add counter melody, change the structure of chords that they're hitting. A lot of really cool options open up for being able to play actual bass lines instead of just playing guitar riffs. So that's what I recommend trying out too. One other that I do, and I'm really struck by this because it seems only a few people are really willing to stretch rules in bass anymore. It's been kind of strange for me to see people questioning whether something's okay to do. But like one of uh, my six strings, I actually have, because when I write, a lot of my stuff is in C. I have at one of my six strings tuned to C, but tuned to C exactly like a guitar. So the top two strings are done at a major third after the fourth string, you know, just like you would tune a guitar. It's basically guitar tuning. So I have it tuned exactly like the guitar because it does a couple of things for me. If I'm playing, especially because I play in a one guitar project, you know, my songs are, you know, down to one guitar part, I play a power trio type of aspect, then when I'm at one, it makes the switch over a hell of a lot easier if I'm having to match pieces or do solo parts together, then the fingerings are exactly the same. Two is that it gives me a six strings, verse, you know, worth of area to move in, but not having to suddenly go, oh, well, now I'm a half step down on my open string, so all the riffs have to be thought of as fretted that are once open. That can be a real pain. And the other being that if I want to outline chord pieces or things underneath of a chord, it's the same shapes. I can sit here and see, like, you know, a G standard chord. I can, you know, do it just like I would on a guitar and know that those parts are going to match perfectly with the chord being played. Uh, it also allows me, if I'm doing things like if I'm hitting and strumming a chord or something open, I can take the same chord arrangement that the guitar is doing and say if they go into a lead, I can fill up that space by hitting the exact same chord structures. Uh, the reason that the guitar has the altered tuning is because it makes some chords that, if you were in standard tuning, wouldn't be really easily attainable or possible. You can now hit those too. So I have, uh, you know, one of my six strings is in standard, but I keep the other one in C, completely tuned like the guitar, so I can cover its range and mine with the same fingerings. I've seen people literally ask, is that okay? Or why would I tune it a bass that way? You can do whatever you want. Metal is the rule breaker. I don't understand why there's suddenly so many rules these days, but go ahead and just do what you want. Try an experiment. Uh, I recommend if you want to have some fun and you have a five or a six string or even a four, go and try some of, you know, the older, even open blues tunings or things like that and try strumming maybe octaves and open drones and things. Just see what you come up with. But have an adventure with it because the one thing that I find that using altered tunings really tends to do for people is it takes away your ability to play by pattern. You know, we tend to learn our scales and then we play in the same patterns and things and we almost shut off our ear. We stop listening because 
we know where the fingers go. It's kind of, you know, painting by paint by number. You're just filling in the boxes with the right color. Whereas if you don't know what those notes are, you have to listen and figure your way through. So this is where I was alluding to earlier. I'd really like to recommend using altered tunings as a way to become more fluid or to think out pieces you normally wouldn't in standard tuning. Now, what do I mean by that? I really recommend that on a regular basis, taking at least two of the strings on your bass and tuning them to a random note. Just say, you know, we'll take the E string and tune it up a whole step. And then we'll take the G string and we'll drop it a minor third. Make sure you're on a pitch because this will be important later, but just randomly, you know, put things on there and then try and play. What you're gonna wind up doing is now nothing is where you think it is. You're gonna go for that fifth, but it's not gonna be a fifth anymore. So instantly you have to start listening and you'll start writing and playing completely by how something sounds, not by how can I make this complicated or how can I do this shape that I do. It forces you to break out of habits and you're gonna start writing from a completely different point of view, being the one you should be writing from, which is listening. So once you figured it out, you know, just sit there, take you know an hour, you know, just relax, take a break, get yourself a coffee, sit down and just jam out on it and come up with stuff. And you'd be surprised how often you come up with cool and fun ideas because it kind of resets you back to, you know, being a complete beginner. You have to just feel out your way through the instrument because you have nothing to tether you to it. And what that's going to do for you is make your creativity and your improv skill become more and more sharp because you learn to really listen to your instrument again. Whereas once we get a little bit of skill, we stop doing that quite as much. So try that out. And then what you do is record yourself or write out, you know, what these things are. If you note it by notes, retune your instrument now. And here's where the fun part comes. Go and learn in standard tuning how to play what you just played. I guarantee you what it's also going to do is, one, you're going to have something that was written completely by ear, but now you're also going to have to figure out a way to play it in standard tuning, and you're going to play things you never would have figured out before. It's going to break you out of your scale boxes. It's going to make you have to look at the fingerboard in a different way, and that's a gift that'll take you, you know, for the rest of your playing. Because now that you play it and you've done this thing, that doesn't just go for that one part. Now it's going to affect the way you see it. And now you'll start creating variations on that. Like, oh, I like this note. And I know it completely because of its sound, not because it fits in, you know, my minor nine or whatever I'm doing. I like how these notes go together. So now it's a little piece that's going to go into your improv bucket and then you start creating variations on that. And the way you play in standard is now going to get laid on top of that. And you come up with really interesting ideas that are going to be all your own and are ideas that really came out of you because you selected everything by note and not by rote. Oh, God, you got to love a good punny rhyme, don't you? Uh, but I have a lot of fun with that. And when I'm stuck for ideas sometimes or I just feel like I'm playing the same thing over and over, that is the fastest way for me to break out of it. You have to put yourself on unfamiliar ground to really bring out your own creativity. Twist in two knobs and have an edit. That's about as easy and as quick a way as I can think to guarantee yourself some new ideas. So try that out with your altered tuning. And you never know, sometimes you may come across your own tuning. Everything's legal. You know, you may sit here and just twist things and come up with a chord or a bass line and go, this just rocks. I like this. And then go to your guitar and write a song in that. Happens all the time. You got bands like Soundgarden that used to use, you know, crazy tunings and stuff like that. Bring back your sense of adventure with altered tunings. Don't just look at them as in all oh, Devin Townsend does this or this person does that. You know, try and create something of your own. But at the very least, try this experiment and I'd love to hear it. Hit me up in the comments down below and tell me after you've tried this type of stuff, how has it worked out for you? 
And do you have any altered tunings that you really like or songs that use altered tunings that you've always liked and wanted to spend maybe a little bit more time with? Sometimes, and that's the funny thing, is there's songs written in really strange tunings and none of us realize it because it's just good melodies. We assume that it was written normally when it wasn't, and there's some great ideas hidden inside of it. So, let me know your thoughts on it. I'll see you down below. So, a recurring theme on the channel with me has been how much I like older gear. And I know... Some people think it's just kind of fanciful or revisiting the past, but that's not always really the real reason why I go after this stuff. And I'm going to explain it a little further, hopefully encourage you to try some out. And I think I'm also going to make my point and justify it. Older gear has something that we don't have quite as much now. I think we've gotten into this thing of seeing things from purely a planned obsolescence, technological progression thing. You know, whatever's the newest is always the best and that kind of thing. And it's not true. If it were true, then Ikea furniture would be much cooler than a 16th century, you know, French chateau, beautiful piece of uh, furnishing. The other part that really kind of steers this and what I hope to get across here is that more and more music has been, especially gear-wise, been pushed in a certain direction. Like, one of the things that disturbs me the most when I read forums or Facebook or something like that is I see this question all the time. What's the best block for blah? You know, what's the best amp for metalcore? What's the best bass for gent? What's, like, people just plugging in pre-decided ideas for a tone that they just want to get that sound, and that's it. Zero innovation, and, and like a form of music already has its you know sonic fingerprint, and you don't stray from it. And obviously, gear has kind of pointed itself to that. You can't fault the manufacturer if that's what people want. You know, they come with all these presets, and this amp for this, it's the ultimate crusher deathcore machine, the ultimate eight-string eight amp, the ultimate... Uh, you know, sub-low bass amp. So you keep getting all these things that are geared towards a specific sound rather than geared towards facilitating your sound. The reason I like so much older gear is that it doesn't have a thing anymore. It doesn't have a modern context. Like, I can go back and, you know, I don't think you can see it in my rack, but people pointed it out before. Uh, I still have an ADA MP1 guitar module that I've gotten sounds out of that people are like, oh my God, what head are you using? That's brutal. So it's, uh, it's that piece of crap you wouldn't pick up. Uh, you can see at the bottom of my rack back there, I have a Yamaha SPX90 effects unit. Love those things. It's considered incredibly dated, noisy, all this stuff. But if this gear is so bad and so horrifying, then why can't anybody explain to me how even before this gear was made, there are albums that sound better than what's out now and have stood the test of time way better than what we're doing? Technology passed a point a long time ago where we had to be worried about quality or, you know, what was in. And the funny thing is, you see that this cannibalism of it has been going faster and faster. Remember when pods were amazing? They're so badass, and everybody had one. It's this credible innovation. Six months later, everybody's selling them. Then it's Axe Effects. Then it's Helix. Then it's Kemper. Then it's, and I'm not just bagging on modelers. I'm just talking about one progression. But it's always this new thing that's always the greatest thing ever, and six months later, it's junk that no one will pick up and no one will do. And it's because each one of it is geared towards a specific set of sounds and a certain sonic fingerprint. And then when the new one comes in, that's it. And it's mostly because people just don't innovate with things. They get it and they want it to solve all their musical problems. And when it doesn't, the newest and the greatest is what comes in. And they spend more and more money and just make the same song over and over. The reason I like the older gear is, again, because it doesn't have a context now. It's not being used on records. It's kind of you know, an empty canvas. I can go back with no preconceived ideas about, you know, these patches or their sounds and just start using my ear and I create sounds out of them that 
I know other people won't get because they're too stuck in these things that all sound the same and are all based on the same idea. And, you know, they, they just buy it because they want the sound in the demo video, the preset that somebody uploaded. That's all of what they're after. Whereas I have zero starting place with this stuff. It's, you know, like with the SPX 90, everybody's like, oh, the symphonic preset, you know, Zach Wilde, you know, that's what it sounds like. No, that's not what it sounds like. It can sound that way, but I could use it for a completely different purpose now and explore it with all these new modern tools and modern playing and use it on bass or try something else. See, that's the thing is I have, I can do it in unexpected ways and get new ideas out of it. And the funny thing is, it seems to go in this ridiculous cycle in that every once in a while, somebody realizes the gems that have been sent back there and everybody will trash this gear until one of the YouTube talking heads, this guy, comes back and says something about it. Now, all of a sudden, it's a lost gem, and the stuff they were pissing all over two days ago is suddenly so great, man, and everybody jumps on it for five seconds, and then when it doesn't solve all their problems, they, you know, of course, jump back off ship. But you can see it all the time. And in a way, it kind of aggravates me just from, you know, a complete snob point of view, and that I go, yeah, I've been... I've been down with the 80s gear for a couple decades now, and, you know, it really seems like it's caught on now. But I especially don't like the way that a lot of these guys come out with this kind of sheepish way of trying to admit they still like it or trying to revive it. This, hey, guys, I just found this 80s thing. Huh? Remember how dumb that was? It doesn't sound too bad. Hey, what, what do you think? And then they wait for the audience to jump in and tell them it was okay to like it. And then they come back with another video, ADA MP1, suddenly everywhere all over the web. And so is the XPX90. Check that one out in YouTube and see how many recent results you get on both of those. But then everybody jumps in and goes like, oh, yeah, you know, I did my last video. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. Let's really do a deep dive, as they call it. And then all of a sudden, everybody's buying them up and the market price shoots through the roof. Uh, you know, and you can see it with a ton of things and it, it goes in waves. PVVTM amps. If you're looking for a good amp that absolutely shreds cheap as hell, although it's going up now because everybody jumped on it. PVVTM. Awesome. You get these guys going on about it and it's like, it, it's kind of like any other uh, fashion, like skinny jeans were or anything else. It really is about fashion. It's crap. Look at all these guys with their skinny pants. Now we're going to start wearing baggy things. And then baggy jeans were the thing for a while until it got ridiculous, like Jinko and stuff like that. And the, and rappers or the hip hop community that would look at rockers jeans and be like, oh, their pants are too tight. Now they're all wearing skinny jeans. It's you really just have to kind of let all of it go. And. It makes sense financially that you can go back and get this stuff cheap if you're willing to buy the stuff that isn't being revogued. And the other part is, it's just fun. You know, it's sounds that you don't hear. You know, all, this, all the gear that's out right now is geared towards the sounds that are hot right now. And not saying there's anything wrong with it. I use a lot of modern gear, too. There's incredible innovation going on. But... I like the idea of being, you know, in a embarrassment of riches of having all the new technology, but being able to revisit sounds of the past and then use them in a new context. So now they're not sounds of the past anymore. My end argument for this and the one that I think proves my point and justifies it utterly, the entire modern dance and electronic music genre. If you remember when the first drum machines came out, and here's a little history lesson from Uncle Rodney. Uh, you know, basically during and post-disco era, you had the infamous Rollin drum machines that came out, the TR-808 and the 909. They were absolutely torn apart when they came out. These don't sound like real drums. What is this? This is garbage. Listen, this is just, this isn't human. This doesn't sound good. The, you know, this is just people with no talent. It was ripped all over and 
it was only used by people who were really trying to make, you know, dance and disco and that type of stuff. And they eventually faded in popularity. Later on, you get the drum and bass techno and uh, house revolution that happened. And all of a sudden, everybody starts revisiting those machines. And suddenly, they're not garbage that you can find in a, you know, a pawn shop somewhere for 20 bucks anymore. They are highly sought after machines that to this day are the default machines used to make that music. If you're a hip hop production place and you don't have an 808 inside your room, you're not a hip hop production place. It's not happening. It is essential gear. It's like having strings on a guitar at this point. And now those things bring incredible prices. I lucked out on that in that when I was first trying to learn how to program, I bought an 808 from a friend of mine when I was in my teens, who was like, yeah, this is a piece of crap. I paid $25 for it. I kept it around, used it here and there. I upgraded to a machine that fit me a little better, but I always just had it kind of laying around. I needed some money when I was in music school. I put an ad in a uh, paper in LA called The Recycler and put it up for sale used. I got $1,300 for it. Just a piece of junk machine to me, but it was such a sacred item, it had shot up that much in price. And I had people fighting to get it, people outbidding each other. I had another guy offer me 16 if I would tell the guy who was in my living room, no deal. So old gear that at the time people are just pissing all over it, saying it's not good, that type of thing becomes the, the absolute foundation of a completely new form of music. And suddenly the sound isn't dated. It's one that they can't replicate, that they keep trying to get soft sense to be able to duplicate. But everybody just wants that original 808 and they love it. There's whole songs written about the 808. So then you have like the 303 became upset, you know, essential for a lot of dance and rave stuff, things like that. But my point is, without going on too long, that created an entire genre of music from one of the most hated and disregarded pieces of music production equipment ever made. So it's not about the technology. It's not about the uber clarity. It's not about the... the perfect fidelity in the quality of the samples. It's, are you able to make something good with it? And people found it and they decided they fell in love with it again and they did it. Same way that I go back and find a lot of this stuff and I go, I don't care how Zach Wilde used it. I don't care how White Snake used it. I don't care how Paul Gilbert used it. I'm gonna use an XPX90 because I love the character of its tone and some things, but I'm gonna apply it in a different context. So I think that pretty well vindicates me on that it's not just some novelty or some kind of thing using every tool out there. So don't use a piece of gear just because it's in vogue. Trust your ears, try new things, save some money. And uh, you never know, you may pioneer something new, something cool. Lord knows we could all do with some sonic originality these days. So since we did talk about it before and it was really cool and interesting, hit me up in the comments below. Let me know if there's some favorite piece of gear of yours that's gone under the radar that you really enjoy and still use and maybe doesn't get the respect it's deserving. I'd like to hear it and uh, I always look for new ideas too. Let me steal your VTM. In any case, once again, always appreciated to you guys checking it out. Please like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell. And that's going to do it for this Metal Base Monday. You have a good one. Get out there and practice. I'll see you on the next one.